Today is April the 29th, 2014, and I'm here in the Senior Physiologist Lounge at the American Physiological Annual Meeting at the San Diego Convention Center. And today I have the pleasure and the honor of interviewing Dr. Lise Bankier for the Society's Living History Project. Dr. Bankier is a long-standing member of APS who has been affiliated with INSERM based in Paris. INSERM is like the French equivalent of the NIH. Dr. Bankier's research is focused on renal physiology and renal pathophysiology. Dr. Bankier, it's a pleasure. Welcome to the Living History Project and thank you for agreeing to be interviewed for this. Um, if you're ready, we'd like to start with some questions. Yeah. I'm and ready. a conversation yeah. about your career. Yeah. So let's start with, uh, um, sorry. What can you tell us about your family upbringing and how you became interested in science? Yeah. Uh, before I answer that question, I would really like to say how pleased I am to have been selected for these interviews. It's a great pleasure for me. I am very honored. And so I thank the uh, American Society of Physiology for giving me this opportunity to, to be here today and to tell you a little bit about my career. So regarding my uh, family life, I have been, I am the oldest of three children and I have been raised as a, almost as a single child because my two brothers were much younger than I, so I was relatively independent. And there is nothing very important to say. I have had a nice life. Uh, I was raised in Paris. I have always been in Paris, missing a little bit the countryside, but <laughs> that's my life. And there was nothing special. Nobody in my family was in science. No doctors, no scientists. My parents uh, had a store where they, sell, they sold jewelry and my father had been working in uh, import-export with the United States and both my parents spoke English. I think that helped me a little bit because my ability to speak English has been relatively better than that of many other French scientists. And can, can I ask how they came to be able to speak English, how they learned? Yeah, my father worked since he was uh, 16 in an American company in France who was buying antiques and art pieces and uh, various artifacts to send them to the United States in a department store to be uh, displayed and sold in the department store. So he's, he learned English with the clients and yeah. he was, uh, uh, he used it continuously in his uh, professional life. And my mother, she just uh, enjoyed so much uh, the American troops coming to France after, uh, during the war and uh, freeing Paris. And she was so enthusiastic. She spoke with the soldiers and then after that, she went, she probably had learned English at school first, but she went to see movies in American and she could speak very good. Okay. Uh, she, had, she was gifted for yeah. languages. So I have heard English in my youth and yeah. I think it has been really important because among the French people, not so many of my age were speaking good English. So yeah. I, I like to come to American meetings and I could really communicate easily. Yeah. Well, I think is it. Yeah. <laughs> so what really got your interest in science then? Yeah, I was very curious about life. Since the, the very beginning, uh, I remember always wanting to understand how animals breathe, how they uh, live, how they move. All what was living was re very interesting. Maybe more animals than plants, but even plants. I remember in our flat in Paris, I was growing some small plants. My parents did not, but I had, uh, I wanted to see how plants develop, how the leaves open and everything. So I had always this curiosity about life and I wanted to become a doctor. But my parents thought it was not a good idea. Being a doctor meant you would be uh, disturbed in the middle of the night by somebody who had some problems and so on. You would not have a family life and so they discouraged me and I was relatively young. I was influenceable. I accepted that I should not be a doctor and now I, so I 
took something else that was close to, because it was biology, and I did studies uh, in the university in Paris in biology, and actually that was really a good choice, because I realize now that maybe I would not have been a good doctor. What I like is understanding how it works. It's not uh, helping each patient, patient yeah, fix it. Yeah, to, yeah. to get better, yeah. uh, to try to understand what disease they have and give the appropriate drugs. Maybe this would not have been a good way for me. But research is wonderful. So I always enjoyed doing research and it's uh, very good. But I had no influence in my family. Okay, and then your training. So you, you said you did a biology degree. Yes. Tell us a little bit about where, how you made your next steps and what decisions okay, helped so you. Okay, so I had no idea what I, am, uh, what I would do and at that time there was very little information about the career possibilities and uh, all that. So my uh, normal uh, way would have been to become a teacher in biology in uh, high in uh, graduate school or so and I didn't feel attracted by teaching so one of the teachers one of the professors proposed me one day to work in his lab I had absolutely no idea what research was but I accepted and I worked uh, it was a six months uh, small contract I worked in his lab and the virus of research caught me <laughs> and I, I enjoyed very much uh, what I was doing and the atmosphere and the curiosity uh, of that you need to have to go to the next step and so that's how I became interested but at that time you didn't need a PhD to start to work in the lab it was really uh, easy and I got a position at INSERM the French Institute uh, of Health uh, and Medical Research. I got a position, um, I think uh, I was, I cannot give the equivalent in the American system, but I had not been uh, very much advanced in my studies. Uh, but then after I had already this position and I was paid a small salary, very small, but I was paid, I got, uh, I made two PhDs, one which is uh, more time, which requires a longer period of, of research than the uh, usual PhD of, that we have now. So this is the highest degree you can have in the French university. So I went up to that degree and I had uh, three children at the same time okay. <laughs> so I managed to have my family life and my professional life both together it worked well yeah mm -hmm. and your your degree how long did that PhD take you had three children it must have been yes it took much longer and actually it could not be possible anymore now because in France you must have your PhD in four years in principle it's three years you can ask for an extension one year more but my, uh, my longest PhD took, uh, I think, six or seven years. Do your children have any recollection of you writing the PhD and, and working for it? Mm, yeah, I don't think so. They may have only a recollection of how we had to assemble the pages because at that time it was very difficult and very expensive to have a thesis reproduced and we needed to give, I don't remember how many, 80 samples, 80 copies, because one copy should be in each French university, uh, one yeah. copy of the paper thesis, and there was no internet, no, That's right. no um, websites, uh, nothing was available electronically. So I had to make myself, because it would have been too expensive otherwise, the 80 copies of a, page of a thesis that had maybe 200 pages. So yeah. we were assembling all the pages uh, one after the other and my children helped me. So yeah. that they, they probably recall remember. That. <laughs> yeah. So then how did you really develop your expertise in, in renal physiology and renal pathophysiology? I assume your PhD was in that area. Yes, my PhD was in that area. I was very much influenced by uh, two people at that time, at that early time, François Morel, a professor in renal physiology, 
actually in all physiology, but he insisted more on the renal physiology because he was himself a renal physiologist. He has been really well known at his time. Uh, for example, Moberg knows him, knew him very well. He died already, uh, Francois Morel. Uh, he has received the Homer Smith Award of the American Society of Nephrology. He was very well known at a certain time. He has been my uh, teacher, my professor in, uh, during uh, my uh, years in the university. And he was passionate and he made people be passionate about what he was teaching. So I really enjoyed that very much. And uh, later on he was in the jury of my two theses. And the other person was Jean-Pierre Grunfeld, a well, um, world known nephrologist who has been uh, contributing a lot to uh, genetic uh, diseases, kidney diseases. Um, he supervised my thesis. He had very little time because he was involved in clinical work. So we spent maybe two hours a week together, but it was very intense and he was very rigorous, very good advisor. And so that was the beginning of my uh, own research because after my thesis, after I ended uh, my work with him, I started a new topic and not very new, it was related to the previous one, but uh, I had my own ideas and started to have my own hypothesis and test them. Uh, but he has been uh, very influential at the beginning to put me into the yeah. nephrology. So how did the progression from a PhD in the French system work? Did you do postdoctoral work? No, I never did because I had three children and my husband was working in France so I couldn't go away and it was less uh, common at that time. But I have uh, quite soon established international collaborations with uh, people that I met in meetings. Or, uh, so I started a work that was more uh, fundamental. I started to work in uh, studying the consequences of vasopressin on the kidney and many of my studies in the early times were anatomical. We saw profound anatomical changes. At the beginning it was by chance I must say but we picked up the finding and we emphasized, we thought it was important and we did more research. So uh, we were able to compare uh, kidneys of rats that have been concentrating their urine or kidneys of rats that did not concentrate urine. Uh, there is a strain of rats called the Brattleboro rats which have a genetic defect uh, in the vasopressin gene and they cannot produce the hormone vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. Uh, so they have a diabetes insipidus, they never concentrate their urine. And by comparing these rats which could not concentrate with rats in which we were inducing a high urine concentration by infusing them, no, at that time by giving uh, twice daily injections of uh, vasopressin tannate yeah. in oil or later on uh, DDAVP, an analog of vasopressin, we had to inject them because there was no mini pumps, there was no infusion system. And we noticed marked profound anatomical changes in the kidney, which resembled, which resembled the, uh, change, the, the differences that are seen in desert adopted rodents compared to uh, uh, mammals that do not concentrate urine very much like the beaver. Or, so yeah. it was surprising because what was occurring in different species could also be induced in one species, one. the rat, by manipulating the urine concentrating ability. So, so that was yeah. relatively fundamental but uh, not very interesting for the clinical field. But I was pleased that we had uh, a few papers about this. And then came and uh, appeared a paper in the literature which made me really enter in the field of the pathophysiology. There was a paper showing uh, by uh, Hostetter and Brenner and other colleagues. Uh, it was in the 1980 something, showing that uh, uh, 
high protein diet was deleterious for the kidney. That was an experiment in rodents uh, because it induced hyperfiltration, what was called uh, already at that time hyperfiltration. That is an increase in the GFR, in the glomerular filtration rate, the, the first step of urine formation. So this increase, after some time, became adverse, became uh, detrimental and uh, accelerated the progression of a kidney disease, whatever the disease was. And so it came to my mind that this uh, adverse effect of high protein diet was due to the fact that the kidney needed not only to excrete more urea, which is the end product of proteins, mm -hmm. but also to concentrate urea in the urine. Because the plasma urea level is relatively low, and the daily load of urea that humans excrete need that urea be concentrated about a hundredfold in the urine with respect to plasma. And in rodents, it may be 500-fold. So this is something I, I realized that might have been the part, at least, of the deleterious effects of protein. So I entered in the field of uh, kidney disease by this, and this similarity of high protein diet and high urine concentration came to my mind on a nice sunny day on a lift to mountain in the ski station okay. during a holiday. <laughs> yes. I suddenly thought, oh, this is the link between adverse effects of protein and, uh, yeah. and urine concentration. So we explored that uh, possibility by an appropriate experiment, yeah. and uh, we had a series of papers showing yeah. that it was true. So I published a paper in 1990, uh, which showed that if we induce a kidney disease in rats by a very simple model that was widely use, used, uh, and if we give the rats three times more water to drink, than they would do spontaneously by uh, some uh, technical artifact. We added uh, water with their food in a way that they had to ingest it. So they had a much higher urine volume, and they concentrated urine less. And they did much better than the rats, which had their normal fluid intake. So just giving more water, which of course lowers the hormone vasopressin. Yeah. Uh, anti it should be called in some cases antidiuretic hormone. So lowering antidiuretic hormone without changing the protein level of the diet, just increasing water intake made the rats m go much better and be uh, less, uh, the progression of the renal disease was much, much attenuated. And so this paper has been published, but it remained unknown and not cited, not very much cited, and nobody cared. Water intake was not something important, and urine concentration was not considered by clinicians as something important. And, but now yeah. it's becoming it very yeah. interesting because uh, clinicians start to uh, pay attention to that, and uh, there has been uh, many more studies showing that this uh, effect of uh, urine concentration on the kidney or of vasopressin is indeed deleterious, and there are even studies in humans. Up to now, it's only association studies. It's not yet a proof, uh, direct proof, but uh, there is a suspicion that uh, vasopressin might have adverse effects in many renal diseases. Yes, and... and Hydration levels. And hydration exactly. levels, which, which yeah. modify the vasopressin secretion. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a great pleasure for me to see that after uh, almost 30 years, 25 yeah. years, my old papers are now much more cited than they were, That's and uh, people start yeah. to realize that uh, these rat experiments were useful and And interesting. I think it, what you said about having that discovery on the ski lift, I mean, that's an important component. You were on holiday. Right, you were yes. relaxed and thinking when about I things. When I really got the, the main but, yeah. idea that started an experiment yeah. in that new field, because it was a new field for me, I was in the concentrating uh, uh, in the morphology of urine of the kidney during high or low urine yeah. concentration, and suddenly I entered in the protein intake and in uh, kidney yeah. disease. Yeah. Yeah.
See, vacations are good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you you feel more relaxed and you can think in a different way yes. if you are not busy with phone calls and yeah. uh, deadlines and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Yes, it's important so. to relax from time to time. So, is there? We've talked a lot about your contributions to physiology. Is there anything else you'd like to add or? Um, yeah, I would like to mention some important things that have made me so happy. The first one was when I was asked, asked to write an editorial review in AGP. I was so proud. <laughs> Maybe I was the first French people to do that, I'm not sure. But uh, it was not so common that uh, French people were invited to yeah. write a review in an American journal. So this first review appeared in 1985. It took me two years to write it. But at least I was extremely proud yeah. of that. Now I have written many reviews. Yeah. It's not so much. But the so first much, one was But important. the first one. And uh, I would also mention one thing that I have been extremely proud of is to receive two years ago the Berliner Award. This was, of course, a great time in my life. and I was uh, extremely pleased. I think I was only the second woman to get it and yes. the first uh, international was person or something yes, like that. Yes, Bodil Schmidt-Nielsen was yes, the first. Yes, she had and it And it's the me. renal section most yes. prestigious award. Yes. And yes, you received it two years ago. Yeah. So congratulations. Uh, so I was really very yes. pleased and this uh, is something important for yeah. me and it was uh, uh, very much appreciated in France, even more than a prize I received in France, which was much bigger in uh, terms of the amount of money. I received a prize from the uh, French uh, National Academy of Medicine uh, about the same year, at okay. six months interval. But nobody paid attention to that <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> and the yeah. Berliner were uh, more prestigious because it was from an American society. Yes, yeah. that's great. So tell us about your very first American Physiological Society meeting and, and how you see it's different to today. You know, can you remember which... So, when yeah, I don't remember when was the first time I came to an EB meeting, but I remember uh, sending abstracts to EB and coming there probably since the years 85 or so. And at that time, it was called FASEB, Federation uh, of the American Societies of Biology. Uh, that was great because I was meeting people. I love to speak with people. I usually speak about my ideas, and I'm not afraid that they would be stolen. So yeah. uh, the competition was less intense than it is now. Yes. And uh, actually, some of my ideas have been stolen twice. But uh, I, I, I'm a person who likes to discuss with others, and it makes me uh, think better. If I have to explain things to other people, they become clearer in my own mind, I think. And uh, so having to meet people outside of my usual environment in Paris, having to meet people in this uh, meetings which have become more and more international actually. Yeah. It was really great and uh, I enjoyed coming to the meeting. What were the differences between that time and now? I cannot say. It was smaller. <laughs> but uh, besides that, I have no special memory of the possible differences. And when you came to those meetings, were you a student or a No, no. I started to come to these meetings uh, for 10, 15 years after I had been already in research and uh, well advanced, yeah. I did not come at the early, uh, in the early years. And uh, one thing I must uh, tell is that uh, my career has been very slow at the beginning. Not only because I had three children, but I did some work and there was not such a pressure to publish papers at that time. I have had possibly two or three papers in the first eight years of my career, maybe more, but I don't think so. And it, I started really to have many uh, more publications when I got people to work with me. Then I was able to follow several different topics and each of them had some results and so we had more papers to publish. 
And the first two people who worked with me have stayed for 25 uh, years each or even more. And I am now in the, in the laboratory of the person who was my former student, and she is the head of the lab now. Okay. Nadine Bubi. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. we have been a, a team, really. She, yeah. We worked, we have 20, 25 papers together. It was really mm -hmm. great, and uh, she is now still in the lab and uh, has become the head of the lab. And do you think there's more represent? You mentioned that it was more international now. So oh, there's yes. more people All coming these, over. Yeah. The, 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 First, there are more exchanges of scientists between the States and, uh, and any other country, more French people coming to the States. Uh, the meetings, uh, whether it's the American Society of Nephrology meeting, where I really often, uh, that I really often attend, or whether it's the EB meeting, there are many more foreign people than there were. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'll just add, there's probably a lot more women, right, than when you probably, first came. But I have seen many women who disappear after a while. Okay. I have noticed that. Women I followed, I knew, I discussed with them, and at certain point they have children and they quit science. I've had a few cases like yeah. that, especially in the States. But fortunately it's changing, I agree. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and you mentioned earlier to me that Marty Frank was the reason that you joined APS. Yes, yes. What impact has that had? Yeah, it, it was really great because, you know, I did not think that I could belong to an American society. I'm a French person. I came a few times to some meetings, but at one point, I don't remember which year exactly, but probably in the 1980s or something like that, uh, 85 or um, I attended a meeting of the uh, International Union of Physiological Sciences and there was a dinner I don't know why but I was sitting between Heinz Waltin who was a very who he, he's still uh, living and he was at EB two years ago. He characterized but, the Brattleboro. Yes, he, he is he's the, 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 one the one who understood stood the yeah. mutation of the Brattleboro rat, not the mutation at that time, but the interest, the scientific interest yes. of the Brattleboro rats, these rats that are kind of uh, KOs, but uh, yeah. the, at that time there was no technology yeah. to make cow, KO no animals. Crabs, yeah. So he had uh, these rats and he gave me some, and so it was yeah. really very important for me. So I was sitting next to him and to Marty, who I probably did not know at that time, but they both told me, uh, why don't you come to the APS? Why don't you submit your membership? Uh, I had never thought about that, but because they insisted, I did, and I was accepted the next year, and so yeah. I have become a member. Yeah. Yeah. And at the beginning, I don't think they had a special section for international members. I was a member yeah. like any other. Later on, the number of of foreign people increased, so they have uh, now a section for uh, yeah. international. Yeah, they have a committee as well yeah. for international. So. so is there anything else, before we move on um, about students, is there anything else you'd like to tell about us about? students? Well, you, what so advice would you give students starting out today, you know, starting ah, out their career? What advices? Oh, I mean, would tell students to be very curious. If you are not curious, don't go into research. You must always want to understand what to know, want to uh, find out some new things. Uh, you should be persevering. If things don't go the, the way you want immediately, don't go to another field. Continue if you have the money, because this is, yes. of course, something uh, I should mention something about money later on. But uh, if you can have enough uh, financial supply, don't stop your research in a certain field just because you get negative results. Just try to understand why your hypothesis was not true or is not verified. And sometimes you will find something really interesting. So uh, not giving up. After a few negative results, that's something I did and which I think is very important. 
and uh, so be be curious, be inventive, and be persevering. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's about Monet, I want to say something. I have been really very lucky to work at a time in France where we had a budget every year. And that was very important because I did not have too much time to devote to finding sub financial support. Uh, I did a few applications for some additional uh, money, but most of my research was uh, financed by the annual budget of my INSERM unit. So I think uh, compared to what it is today even in France, it's no longer the, the way in France, but at that time that was really good. And uh, I must also say that my research was not very expensive because I had rats that were bred in our lab and that we used, we didn't need to buy them. Breeding rats is a little expensive, but not as much as buying them, yeah. especially when it deals with special rats. And uh, we did not need very expensive tools or very expensive uh, products. And so my research has never been limited by money. But uh, now the people who continue to work in my former lab uh, have much more uh, financial problems. Yeah. So I was lucky to be at that time. Yeah. Yes. So is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we uh, conclude? Uh, no, it's difficult to say. What can I say? I, I would like to acknowledge uh, the contribution of a few other people who okay. have been really important in uh, my life. One is Barry Brenner because he asked me to write a chapter on urea uh, in his book The Kidney. Yes. So in two different editions of his book, I wrote a chapter. He encouraged me also because he, he was the one uh, who drew the attention on the fact that high protein diet was deleterious because of the hyperfiltration it induced in the kidney because of this ex increase in kidney function that was demanding. And so because I was studying urea excretion, the end product of the proteins, he encouraged me in, that, in these studies and I really felt that it was important because he's a very well-known uh, nephrologist yeah. and his encouragements were very important for me. Uh, but I also want to say that unfortunately after two editions there is no more any chapter on urea in his book because there are so many new findings with yeah. the molecular biology and so on. Yeah. Uh, so most present textbook of nephrology do not have a chapter on urea in spite of the fact that it is the most abundant solute in the urine for in mm -hmm. uh, with a normal western type diet 40 percent of the osmols we excrete in the urine is urea and there is no special focus on how urea excretion is regulated and uh, we are missing a number of pieces about uh, the regulation of urea excretion that already Bodil Schmidt Nielsen, another person who was very influential in my career uh, in later years, not at the beginning, um, she already predicted in the 1960s that urea excretion must be regulated. It's not just excreted simple simply by uh, filtration and uh, uh, there are systems that allow to conserve nitrogen other systems in the kidney that allow to excrete more nitrogen or more efficiently and there is almost nobody who studies that and yeah. uh, so i hope the wheel will turn and somebody Again, yeah. will be It'll interested in this field later on yeah yeah and uh, any other concluding remarks? Um, I uh, would like to say, it's, uh, even if I'm now retired, uh, I continue to work with a great uh, enthusiasm and I yeah. think it's extremely interesting and I prefer uh, continuing to investigate some uh, biological or medical problems than uh, playing golf or <laughs> <laughs> skiing <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I really enjoy uh, yeah. being still being in research and 
attending meetings, yeah. discussing with colleagues, publishing papers. Yeah. One thing I may add that I forgot to say earlier is that in my work, I have always tried to put pieces together uh, like a puzzle. And I think I've read a lot of papers, even old papers sometimes, yeah. and the more recent ones, of course, I try to keep up with the new findings. And uh, in the reviews I have written, and I'm still writing two reviews yeah. right now, I try to put pieces of puzzle together in a way that people had not really tried before. And sometimes I find an explanation for something that comes from bringing together a number of observations. Yeah. And this is extremely uh, interesting yeah. and I like it and yeah. I do it and uh, I hope to publish a few yeah. more reviews where I put my knowledge, the things I know, the things I find in the literature, but then I make a, yeah. a, a bigger picture than the one we had before. So I hope I can contribute a little bit more to well, uh, propose new hypotheses and uh, uh, I cannot check them now, I don't have a lab anymore, but yeah. if I write them in a review, they may be useful to somebody Stimulate someday. Someone. And maybe some of my hypotheses will turn to be, to be wrong, but even the wrong hypotheses stimulate research and yes. I think it's worth publishing them. Well, as the renal section chair, I've observed you at many meetings and, and coming and I'm always um, pleased when you you're always willing to ask questions of the trainees and I think it's important for them to get the input from yeah. senior physiologists and to get you know to tell them to read the papers in the past yeah so yeah. thank you for for coming and thank you for contributing you. especially to the renal section yeah and thank you for being willing to be interviewed today yeah and thank you again for interviewing yeah. me it's such a pleasure to be yeah. here I hope uh, what I've explained can help the young yeah. scientists and okay. I will be serving the uh, APS as much as I can, uh, as long as I can. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.